You want us to go, Aubrey? Because yeah. a lot of people are still at the break. All right, well, uh, welcome everybody. It gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce a session on immunosenescence and immune reju rejuvenation. And uh, Dr. Janko Nikolaj Zugic uh, will uh, talk about uh, restoring the useful T lymphocyte profiles uh, and consider the influence uh, of lifelong viral infection in modifying uh, the functional properties of these cells. Janko? Thank you, Alex. So, um so the reason why, why um, you know, many people are still at the break is exactly what Alex said. This is the immunology session, so many people will flee. I will try to make it a little less intimidating. Uh, I would first like to uh, really acknowledge people that did this work, none more so than Megan Smithy, a research assistant professor in, in my group, uh, who has done uh, most of the work that I will present, and she was helped by various other people in the lab. Um, we will start by doing a little bit of immunology 101. Um, so the immune system uh, is there for a reason, and we have it in order to uh, defend against infection. And the way that we say that in a fancy manner is that this is the system that has evolved to discriminate between non-infectious self, which it should not attack, and the infectious non-self that it should attack. Uh, we have two kinds of immune systems. One is evolutionarily very ancient and very well conserved. It's called the innate immune system. This is the basic sensing mechanism that we share all the way with fruit flies and other uh, lower organisms. And microbial pathogens are first detected by that system. And uh, innate immunity has the job of containing the initial burst of pathogen proliferation, slow them down, and then alert our second system, adaptive immune system, which is much more precise, much more sophisticated, and that really helps uh, uh, eradicate the a pathogen down the line. So by exposure to antigen, all of our adaptive immune, T uh, immune cells, B cells and T cells, can be divided into two broad categories. Naive cells that have been made in primary lymphoid organs in bone marrow and the thymus, and they have migrated to secondary lymphoid organs where they're essentially sitting and waiting for the contact with their antigen. We call them naive because they have never seen their bug before. And these cells are very, very diverse. They're ready to meet any challenge. They're sort of like uh, the Department of Defense. You have to invest a lot of resources into having these armies deployed. You never know whether you will be employing them. Most of them will never go into combat. But that's the only way to ensure that whatever comes, that you can meet it and, and, and really react to it. These are the cells that deal with new infection that we have never encountered before. Memory cells, by, by, by contrast, are the cells that arose from these naive cells. When they meet the antigen, naive cells will differentiate. They will get hardwired in a different manner. They will get armed. And whereas most of them will die off after you eliminate an acute infection, some of them will survive for very long periods of time. They will now assume some stem cell-like characteristics. They will be able to maintain themselves for long periods of time. And they will be able to very, very rapidly react to those bugs that we have seen before or to the bugs that are similar to the bugs that we have seen before. So they provide the rapid response recall immunity. And in order for our immune systems to work well, we need balance between these two. Both are essential for immune defense. Now the problems that we encounter in aging have to do with increased morbidity and mortality from infection, high susceptibility to new and emerging pathogens, and unfortunately the best tool that we have as immunologists to protect us, which is vaccination, is also not working very well in older adults. So some of the reasons behind that have been investigated quite a bit, and we still don't have a complete picture as to what happens to innate immunity. There are some defects that are pro being described. In other cases, there's a lot of descriptions that are saying that nothing is wrong with innate immunity. But certainly, we do know that there are profound problems with adaptive immunity. And within that realm, T cells are really the arm that is affected most consistently and most strongly. Very often, if you repair T cell defects, you can actually bring back uh, the immune responses in aging. So the things that go wrong with T cells uh, can be wrong at three different levels. One are the cell intrinsic problems that occur in the T cells themselves at the cellular level. So if you pull out the T cells, put them in a tissue culture dish, and you ask them to respond to a stimulus, and if those cells are from an older individual, they will not proliferate as well, and they will not produce the cytokines as well. They will not form the signaling complexes early on at the, at the membrane, the so-called immunological synapse, 
as well as, the, as those from the younger uh, individuals. The, the other problem that, that uh, can occur, uh, and we don't have a whole lot of evidence uh, precisely at where it occurs, but it's quite conceivable that it is there, is that the T cell partners in initiating and regulating the response might not be working quite as well. So the T cells don't activate on their own. They need very special, very specific conditions for activation. It's very dangerous to activate a T cell without a good cause. So there's multiple mechanisms in terms of, you know, which partners need to talk to them, cellular partners, as well as the soluble molecules. And so these signals may be delayed, weak, or underproduced. Finally, the particular issue with T cells, which are a very dynamic uh, tissue that recirculates throughout the body, is this population balance. I mentioned the naive and the memory cells. The problems in the old age have to do with the decline production of new T cells, increased consumption throughout the lifespan, and repeated and persistent stimulation. And all of that can result in not having enough cells quantitatively or not having the, enough of the right cells, which is the problem with diversity. And we will be talking quite a bit today about this latter issue. So within that, the, when I say diversity of, these, of the T cells, I mean mostly the diversity in terms of the res receptors that they have for foreign antigens, for different bugs. Each T cell has only a single T cell receptor expressed at its surface. They're distributed clonally. And so if a T cell is eliminated from the population, you might not have that particular specificity anymore. Fact of the matter is that you know, we typically have clone sizes that are not really a single cell, but they're also not thousands of cells or hundreds of thousands of cells. We might have hundreds of cells, or we might have, in the cases of uh, cells that are present in multiple copies, maybe thousands of cells in the human body, but not more than that. And so thinning that population might be a problem. These cells are required to eliminate most pathogens, and the fundamental unit, as I told you, of this response is really the individual T cell receptor, or as referred here as a clonotype. That the clonotype is really defined by the T cell receptor amino acid sequence, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about how this amino acid sequence is formed. This determines how well the T cell receptor will see a bug, and consequently the extent to which this clonotype will be able to respond and eliminate the pathogen. And so these changes of repertoire in aging are really what we're going to be concerned about in today's talk. These changes have been reported. Their functional consequences for protective immunity still remaining completely understood. So our model system are the B6 mice. They can be adult or old. And this is what I mean when I say adult or old. Our adults are typically older than what most people use in their laboratories for immunological research, at least. We like our mice to be past the hormonal storm of puberty. Uh, our old mice are over 18 months old and uh, generally 20 to 22 months old. So we're starting today's story with a fascinating um, clinical connection that has been made between persistent viruses, mostly herpes viruses, and within herpes viruses, most notably the cytomegalovirus and human immune aging. So persistent viral infections, as I said, CMV above all, has been associated by many authors with the manifestations of immune aging and even the reduced residual lifespan. And unfortunately, of course, in humans, you cannot really tell who's the chicken and who's the egg. Is this the case whereby cytomegalovirus came and infected people that already had a weakened immune system? Or is it the other way around, that some people got infected with CMV and then that drove their immune system into earlier or more, more pronounced aging. And so the questions that we try to answer here in this project that is gener generously supported by the SENSE Foundation is what is the impact of the lifelong latent herpes viruses upon immune defense? Is cytomegalovirus really the only or the main bad guy? And more, most importantly, what can we do about it if this is all really deleterious, can we do something to rebalance the repertoire or to do something else? So this is the situation in humans from our own cohort study that we're doing independently of this work, where we're looking simply at how quickly the uh, immune system loses the naive cells. This is the blue part of the pie here. We have three types of uh, uh, cells that we're distinguishing here. Naive cells, effector memory cells that are supposed to be currently engaged in combating some infection and central memory cells that are sort of like your resting reserve 
that is sitting there and not currently being engaged, but ready to spring into action when needed. So we're looking here at about uh, the numbers of people analyzed are here on each chart, and they're ranging from 27 to 99 uh, in every age group. So these are people that are 50 to 64 years old. Um, Tuck yesterday asked the question, when does the immune system start to age? Uh, certain viruses certainly tell us that when you cross the, the, the barrier of 50, you're already much more susceptible to some infections. Um, when you cross the other uh, imaginative barrier of 65, or real barrier of 65, uh, things do get worse, but it's obviously a continuous process. So here you see that most of these people, 50 to 64 years old, still have a good balance between these three populations. There's a fair number of naive cells. These are the guys that don't have CMV. When you have CMV in the same age group, your percentage of naive cells goes down, and it's a significant decrease. But this is even more remarkable if you look at the 65 and older. In this case, in our cohort, again, reasonably nice phi here, reasonably nice reserve of naive cells shrinking down if you have CMV infection superimposed. So this is how the clinical observations really look in terms of CMV. So the other thing that you need to know is that when there is a normal acute infection hitting you, let's say a new strain of flu, uh, this would be the kinetics of the immune response. So the virus is here in the dashed line. It goes up quickly. And then your innate immunity goes up almost as quickly as the virus. It's a very immediate response. But it cannot really control the virus by itself. You really need to activate adaptive immunity, CD4 and CD8 T cells, which are primarily in charge, and then the antibodies down the line also coming later on the scene. And as this adaptive immunity goes up, the virus is controlled eliminated. So this is, remember, now sterile immunity. Once you eliminate this infection, you don't have the virus around anymore. What happens at that stage is you've generated from very few precursors a huge population of expanded CD4 and CD8 T cells that now don't have anybody to combat. And then the system basically then kills 90 or 95 percent of all of these cells in order to restore homeostasis. And the rest now remain at some set point where memory is maintained. Very different things happen when you have a persistent virus. So CMV and some other viruses like to grow latent in the organism. So they do this same thing. They go up and down, but they're not disappearing at this point. So this is no longer sterile immunity. They will go into the cells where they will form latency. They will reactivate from latency. And as they reactivate from latency, there is at least a potential that they will persistently, if they infect you, particularly when you're young, be stimulating your immune system for life. And this is exactly what happens with CMV. So this is the data of how this looks with two model infections that we have used in the mouse. So this is the herpes simplex virus that we can give systemically intraperitoneally. Normally, herpes simplex is not a systemic infection, but here we're treating it sort of like CMV. And this really just looks at the number of cells that are specific for this virus. So they go up. And then they go down. And then this is supposed to be the point where the memory is supposed to become stable and low. But look at what happens. It actually starts going back up. And the same thing happens with CMV, which is even more attenuated in the primary response, but then really goes up pretty robustly in, as the months unfold in the life of this mouse. And so this is now a midlife point, really, for this mouse. And this will increase as the mouse gets older. So essentially, this is what happens. In youth, we have many more naive cells compared to the memory cells. And then in the old age, we end up having the other way around. You know, these cells have been mostly spent, and they have not been regenerated. And we had to turn many of these naive cells into the memory cells. But when you have a persistent virus that is going to be reactivating over and over and will be stimulating this uh, situation more and more with HSV or CMV, you basically have these clones of cells that are stimulated with every reactivation of the virus. And this pool of cells, at least theoretically, can grow. And in fact, you've seen experimental data that it does grow. And so what happens is now you have this compartment that not only has converted most of the naive cells to memory, but it has this pool that's preferentially stimulated by every successful and successive reactivation of, of the virus. So is this, this is really the key question. Is this going to lead to? worse responses than you had otherwise from these very few naive cells. And we're measuring this by susceptibility to new pathogens. 
Again, as I told you, naive cells are in the business of defending against new bugs, and so this is what we're going to measure. So our hypothesis is that lifelong persistent herpes virus infection will contribute to a more rapid and more pronounced age-associated loss of naive T cells through memory inflation, which is how we call this process of memory cells not staying stable but going up. And this, reduced, uh, uh, this, this will reduce naive repertoire, which may impair the magnitude or function of the immune responses to new pathogens late in life. So this is the model of what that, that we're going to use. It's the B6 mice. We take them when they're really young here, like the human infants and adult, uh, adolescents will be typically infected with CMV. And we infect them with CMV or with herpes simplex virus. And then we do this longitudinal study that Megan, of course, hates because every experiment that doesn't work means that she needs to stay in the lab for another two years. Um, she will sample them at eight months, 14 months, and 18 months. And finally, around 22 months, she will get good data that will tell us something about old and senescent mice. And then in other designs that, that I will mention later, she also will infect these mice with a third party bacterial infection to see how well are these mice really protected from a new uh, pathogenic challenge. She will monitor uh, sp various specific memory CD8 expansions. She will look at the repertoire in a variety of ways. So this is the method that we use to look at the T cell repertoire. So this is the uh, genomic structure of the T cell repertoire uh, after the genes have recombined. So the T cell receptor genes come together from a number of modular subunits. This is the way to maximize the diversity. So you put uh, one V segment with one J segment and the variable number of D segments here. And all of this actually generates exactly the part of the T cell receptor that will stay over the antigenic peptide when presented by the MHC molecule. The way that the T cells recognize antigen is not alone or in solution. They see fragments of the bug bound to self-MHC molecules. And the structural recognition actually happens so that this most diverse part of the T cell receptor, which is actually not only coming together by the recombinatorial diversity that you get here, but also by deliberate mistakes that happen at the junction of these molecules, uh, these gene segments, and then the DNA repair that happens partially on the template and partially without the template. So there's a lot of non-template additions that you will see here will create incredible diversity at this CDR3 region or complementarity 3 determining region. So what we do essentially is we set up a PCR reaction that will PCR across this region. We will get a bunch of PCR products. And because this is a <coughs> deliberately imprecise method, we will get a lot of PCR products of different lengths. And they will vary in lengths, as you can see here. So if you take these products, resolve them on a gel, you will get a ladder that looks like this. The middle ones will stochastically be the most dominant ones because preferentially you create segments that are about 30 nucleotides or 10 amino acids in that region. And then the bands with 9 and 11 are going to be a little less prominent and those with 8 and 12 are going to be even less prominent. If you ask the machine to give you a readout and to convert this into a histogram, you get basically something like this. The middle peak is the highest one and all of these peaks are really distributed in a Gaussian distribution. You can actually put a Gaussian curve over this. But when you grow old and when, or when there are other disturbances in T cell receptor diversity, you will disturb this profile and you will get pictures like these where there's a single peak here. Most of the other peaks have been reduced and that may mean that many of these cells have been lost and that this has been taken over by one or only a few clones. And this is really what we're measuring by this technique. So this is the revenge of the nerds, only two slides of this type. They're going to be horrible, and you won't be able to read them, particularly from the back row. But essentially, here we're looking at 24 different V-beta families. These, this is one half of the T-cell receptor that we're surveying right now. But we're doing it in a fairly comprehensive way on groups of animals that we have set up here to look at in terms of, of what they do and how their repertoires evolve. We're analyzing them now at a relatively young point. These are uninfected animals, so no CMV. And they're analyzed at eight months of age. And all of these guys are looking relatively Gaussian. This is now converted into the area under curve calculation. And you get their sizes. And so this is the repertoire that we look at. Here, the Gaussian curves that you cannot see actually from above, they're very faint red lines, have been drawn around to show that these histograms really conform to that distribution. 
What happens as you continue with this analysis, what Megan has shown is that 18 months old naive CD8 T cells, which is 16 months post-infection, are now starting to show some interesting development. Naive guys are still very diverse, so they look just like these guys here. A lot of different profiles that are all conforming to this more or less bell-shaped curve. But this is what happens in mice that have been jointly infected with both HSV and CAV. So we've given them two viruses, and a consequence of that is that now they're developing a lot of different disturbances. Now we would expect this from the memory repertoire because memory cells will be responding to these viruses. The question is, how is that impacting the naive cells that are diverse and that are not responding to these viruses when we're looking at them? In other words, is there now a crosstalk between the naive and the memory compartment? And the answer seems to be yes. By this measure, um, Partha Samadhir, who did a lot of this analysis with Megan, has found that he can use this divergence index, which basically tells you how much different profiles, particularly when you aggregate the profiles, are different from the canonical Gaussian distribution. And that is normally, if they're not different, they're sitting here at zero. If they're different, they're assuming some positive value. And you can see clearly that this group that got HSV and CMV is the most different of everybody else. And you can see that the scale also here is, is corroborating that many animals are having these distorted profiles if they have two viruses, as opposed to when they have no infection or perhaps only one virus. So, uh, so then the question is, is that this having functional implications? So we gave these mice a bacterial infection. This is Listeria monocytogenes, which needs CD8 T cells to control it. This is the main mechanism of control. You can see here that not having an infection allows the mice to eliminate the, 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 the bacterial. So not having CMV or HSV allows these mice to eliminate the bacterium quite well, but not so when they have these viruses. So this is the, the a bacterial load in the liver seven days post-challenge. Also, we found that uh, these persistent infections are disturbing the way in which the cells react. We're looking at something called polyfunctionality. It is believed that T cells do their job the best if they're armed with different effector molecules, if they can kill and secrete gamma interferon and TNF alpha all at the same time. This is what we call a polyfunctional T cell. And so this is what's here described in this reddish part of the pie. And you can see that CMV is doing worse than the old uninfected. HSV is doing some different things. It only also has the most of monofunctional cells, which you probably don't want to have either. So our conclusion is that this is also impacting the functional responses by, the, um, by these, these uh, viruses. So these are the, the conclusions that I, what, that I have already uh, spelled out for you. There's alteration in polyfunctional response, impairment in the control of the listeria, and the restriction of the naive T cell repertoire. So the question is, can interventions late in life improve these responses to new pathogenic challenge? What can we do about this? So we've set up several groups of animals to try different types of interventions. Some animals got HSV and then got also a drug that is supposed to uh, quiet down the HSV replication. In other animals, we have tried KGF, which is supposed to bring their thymus back. This is the keratinocyte growth factor. We've tried that in both groups of uh, MCMV and HSV. And then finally, for some other groups, we've said, okay, so they accumulate these large expansions of memory cells, what if we removed some of these T cells and if we gave them some new T cells, will that make things work better? And so the long and the short of it is that the, the drug didn't really work and the KGF really didn't work, probably because it really doesn't do to the thymus uh, the things that it was advertised to do. But the transfer of new T cells after partial depletion did work. And so let me go through the data quickly so that we can have some time for question. So KGF therapy uh, increases thymic cellularity. This is published data from other groups. You can see here that when you put these mice on the drug, that the cellularity of the thymus goes up in both old and the adult. And roughly the old treated is close to the adult untreated, which is sort of what we were hoping for. If you go through thymic subsets, there's different thymic subsets that are going to give rise to CD4s and CD8s. All of this still holds. Uh, when you look at what happened at the periphery, so did this thymic growth result in more cells getting into the functional compartment where they need to work? 
we actually got a little bit of a nasty surprise. We really didn't see a whole lot of effect on the periphery. And that is probably the reason why we're not seeing a good effect of KGF. It seems that KGF, despite the reported data in the literature, really is not allowing the old timers to rejuvenate to the point where it will make new T cells that will go out and be completely functional. And we're doing a lot of research to figure out why. But basically, blood totals and spleen totals was a little bit of a bump here in the adult for CD4s. Uh, not a whole lot of, for CD8s. But we wanted, of course, to know whether this functions well. And the answer is that it didn't. There was really no change to the profiles that we have seen here with KGF. No improvement over MCMV alone. Certainly no restitution to even what the old without infection would look like. Um, so we didn't see remarkable <laughs> results with, with KGF. I'm not even showing you the antiherpes drug here because it didn't work either, uh, and there are different reasons why that, that didn't work, because it really doesn't prevent this inflation completely. We can discuss that later. But the question was then, if we can improve the T cells, will the age environment support their expansion and function? So we basically looked at this transfer experiment. We took low-dose antibody and depleted the T cells from this mouse only partially, and then we've given the infusion of syngeneic T cells from a young B6 mouse. This is sort of equivalent of what you would get if you were to bank your blood when you were young and then ask somebody to reinfuse you when you're older. Uh, what would happen here? So we've transferred some CD8 T cells into these mice. And what we saw here is that this is the level of proliferation when you give the infection to the adults. So a lot of T cells are proliferating at the peak of infection and many fewer proliferate in the old, or in the old with HSV. But if you actually inject the young cells from the adult donor into an old environment and give the same infection, you can see that they're proliferating better than any other group. And the same happens if you give it to the host that has CMV. Uh, if you look at another functional measure, so this is proliferation by BRDU incorporation, this is secretion of interferon gamma in response to antigen. How many cells are specific for the bacterium? Again, you see that transferred adult cells in the old environment here are functioning really, really well. We transferred too few cells to see an impact on bacterial load reduction or perhaps on mortality, which is the other measure that we would really like to do. So the long and the short of it, this seems to be working. We are have set up another cohort now where we're going to repeat these experiments. But our main emphasis is really going to be on T cell depletion and, and T cell infusion. One at the early time point, one at the late, late time point. We want to park these cells in the old environment for longer periods of time to see how long is this effect going to last. And uh, basically, we're ready to, to, to do these studies uh, where we should have the final data by December or, or, or January. So the overall recap here is that persistent viral infections, and MCMV in particular, lead to further reduction in T-cell receptor repertoire, naive cell numbers, and percentages in the old mice over and above the effects of age. Bacterial clearance and T-cell polyfunctional responses are strong, also adversely affected by this lifelong viral in, persistent viral infection. And of the several late-life treatments, we found that antiviral drugs and KGF produced little effects probably because they were advertised as something better than they really are. Uh, but by contrast, the transfer of young adult CD8 T cells into a partly depleted old infected animal showed that such cells can expand and function robustly. So we want to set up the system where they will be the main ones uh, really responsible for immune defense. And so this is really where we're at. Also, the other point is that you know it might make sense to really try these interventions at midlife point rather than then late in life and then see whether there is benefit to that. And so with that, I will gladly shut up and take your questions. Thank you. All right, we have time for uh, three questions. Dr. Rice. Very nice talk. So um, a couple of things. First, when you show your, your repertoire by the PCR and, uh, and, and gel display, you're throwing away an awful lot of information, but on the other hand, the fact, okay, let, let, me, let me back up a little bit. When you see a Gaussian distribution of different lengths, that could be actually masking a, a, a diversity of hundreds or thousands of, of, of actual clonal lineages, 
that just happen to come out the same length. Right. When you start to see lengths disappear, then you've clearly decimated the diversity of that population. The information that you're throwing away is what are the actual families and what happens to the rarer families, which you could get by simply taking those same PCR products and doing deep sequencing. So I would just propose that to you, that don't throw away those samples. We have not thrown away. We okay. saved samples for deep sequencing. Aubrey didn't quite write us the big enough check to do the deep sequencing. Oh, that, that, that comes later. We, we, okay. will be, you know, we will be hopefully doing that, whether we do it by 454 or by, or, or by Ion Thorin, which I think is probably going to work out. So but, question but, but for either you. way, we've, we've banged those samples, and I completely okay. agree. So that was the comment. Question for you is, um, for this to be applicable to, to uh, and this comes out of pure total ignorance on my part, if, if, if you were to apply this to humans, it would require that you actually not have aging of the T uh, stem cell compartment. But there were papers years ago when I kept up with this literature that the at least in humans and it was a, it was it was controversial in mice that the uh, T stem cell compartment aged that is became depleted with age. Is, what's the current status there? So the current status is that you know you're you're going to find the, you know six of one and half a dozen of the other. But the the the, the it seems that the tide uh, really in terms of scientific evidence has turned to to strongly suggest that the stromal component of the thymus is probably what leads to the involution of the thymus. There is certainly a split in terms of the efficacy of production of different lineages from the stem cells as they grow older. And there could be stem cell aging, but it doesn't seem to be, you know, involution of the thymus happens basically at some point between birth and puberty. Already the organ has shrunk and really, really dramatically. Uh, the rest of the components probably take 70 to 80 years to age. And therefore, our, our, our biggest concern, I think, really is going to be with the stromal component of the thymus in terms of fixing. Whether we're going to run into another problem that might be you know, much later in life, you know, we'll deal with that when, when, when it comes. Thank you. OK, we we'll have okay. time for one more question. John? Uh, yeah, very nice talk. Um, you mentioned that it might be helpful for people to bank naive cells at a young age I use. didn't say that, and I don't have a company that I'm invested in. <laughs> <laughs> but when I, when I form it, I will say no. Just kidding. But <laughs> let, me, let me go on from there. Mm -hmm. Suppose someone is already late in life and didn't have the ability to do this banking. Might there be a way to take some stem cells and um, in the test tube somehow recreate a full complement of diversity and then reinfuse that way? Well, I, I think that there's a potential for that. I think that there's certainly the potential to really rejuvenate the thymus. You know, the, so, so KGF numerically gives you a burst in a big, you know, big thymus, as does castration or, or uh, androgen blockade and the IGF treatment, human growth hormone. They will all do the same. It seems that none of them will actually really give you you know, the, the good, good peripheral T cells, but that doesn't mean that we won't be able to figure out what does give us that. And so from that standpoint, absolutely. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, in a few years we will be at the point where we can, you know, by either singular or combined treatments, uh, be able to manipulate both the marrow component and the thymic component to, to get where we need to be. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Your talk is up.